the four apocalyptic horsemen. And the angel thrust his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and cast it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. Revelation 14, 19. These four writers, Kierkegaard, Dostoevsky, Nietzsche, and Kafka, occupy each in his own peculiar way the position of outsiders in the society that had produced them. They lived the insecure existence of spiritual frontiersmen who no longer fit into the accepted categories of theology, philosophy, or belles lettres, and can see during their life no immediate chance for getting the hearing they deserve. They realized that they were both the end products of a dying civilization and the clairvoyant prophets of coming chaos. Kierkegaard's judgment of himself as a quote-unquote enigma, Kafka's self-characterization as quote, an end or an a beginning, close quote, pertain to all four. Their contemporaries dismissed their dark premonitions as exaggerated, unbelievable, or outright fantastic. European society took one of three positions. It was satisfied with its own apparent stability or believed in the general progress of mankind or favored some mild reforms while the political revolutionists were demanding the radical overthrow of the entire existing social organism. Kafka was resigned to the coming triumph of evil, which the other three had also considered a powerful threat or the alarm signal for rallying counter-energies. But Kierkegaard, Dostoevsky, and Nietzsche expected a new phase in mankind's history to rise that would fulfill their spiritual visions, a kingdom to follow disasters of apocalyptic dimensions. Their emphasis on evil marks them as eschatological writers, eschatological writers, Apart from the recognition that came to Dostoevsky in his later years, the world did not accept the messages of these writers during their lifetimes. Kierkegaard had to wait half a century or more. Nietzsche's importance increases with each decade after his death, and Kafka's larger novels were not published until after he had died. He is now slowly emerging from the rank of a bizarre outsider whose work is still considered experimental. All four have a greater capacity for defining critical aspects of human, humanity's condition than for giving voice to concrete leadership or to a specific vision of humanity's future. With the exception of Kierkegaard, whose firmly maintained Lutheran theology was his salvation, they seemed at times to surrender to the via negativa of personal weakness, anxiety, and physical illness. But apart from Kafka, they rose again and again to heroic vision. Dostoevsky and Nietzsche cherished the deviation from the normal as a stimulant, ordained by fate to strengthen the will to resist, to live more exaltedly, and to probe more deeply into the mysteries of existence. Not only do these four out not only do these four stand outside the accepted categories of literature, by uniting the functions of psychologist, philosopher, poet, sociologist, and critic in their diagnosis of Europe's spiritual disintegration. But through their work, they were also instrumental in speeding up the actual process of the destruction they foresaw. Their voices stirred up such intensely partisan responses that only our generation is beginning to see in them more than destructive forces. Their marginal position in society, productive but unintegrated, appealed to many in their own social group who likewise remained unabsorbed, had become resentful and consequently felt inspired by the contempt these writers were expressing for the middle class. Much of their fate as human beings led, lends itself to interesting comparisons and even a few striking parallels. Their spiritual biographers their spiritual biographies are partially explained by the circumstances in which they grew, lived, and worked, but in no case do these conditions supply us with the complete means for interpreting their spiritual course. All four are suspicious of man's pretense before himself and others. 
They vehemently accuse their contemporaries, especially those of the middle class, with not living up to any or very few of their publicly proclaimed moral standards. Kierkegaard calls the church a sham that is making, quote unquote, a fool of God. Dostoevsky never tries, never tires of revealing that many demons lurking in every human being beneath the respectable surface and even within the church itself. For Nietzsche, both Christianity and the middle class are stupid, archonistic, and suspect. Kafka knows of no brave men to oppose the forces of a conniving and scheming evil at work everywhere. Society to him is unprincipled. It was his conviction that the hand of Christianity was weakening. All four were alienated in the society in which they live and their contempt for respectability was deeply rooted in, the, in childhood experiences. A sense of aloneness and disillusionment overshadowed their early years in which a father's strength and affection were missing and in which neither admiration nor the early assurance of parental protection could develop. Kierkegaard's father was a man of religious gloom. The discovery of his erotic defections made such a shocking impression upon Soren that he speaks of it as, quote, an earthquake, close quote. Dostoevsky's father was callous and in temperament in many ways resembling the ill-fated elder Karamazov, and was, like him, murdered when Dostoevsky was still an adolescent. Nietzsche's father died when Friedrich was only four years old. Kafka's father, a successful but sarcastic businessman, remained without understanding for his son's genius. Only such tragic conditions could produce Ivan Karamazov's perverted excuse at the murder trial when he said, quote, what does not desire his father's death, close quote. And Nietzsche's pathetic outcry, quote, what child has not reasoned to weep over his parents, close quote. Their relationship to their fatherland is as ambivalent as their negative position in society. Kierkegaard seems to have only critical things to say about Denmark. Many of his intellectuals, many of his intellectual roots were in the Germany of Hegel and Schelling. Uh, while his criticisms of the Danish church developed rapidly into isolation and finally open hostility. The satirical attacks of the Corsair drove him close to despair. He felt ostracized and solitary the butt of public ridicule. Dostoevsky's love for Russia was, apart from his final pan-Slavic phase, an unhappy one. While his inner relationship to Western Europe vacillated between admiration and hate, he was unhappy in Russia but could not have been born the emigrant lot of not have, living on her soil. After the sudden fame of his poor people, he remained unsuccessful for a considerable period, never overcoming the resentment against a society that had considered him socially awkward and uncouth. It was only one of the many contradictions in his psyche that did not attack Russia politically, nor the wrongs suffered during his Siberian exile. Nietzsche lived outside Germany from his 25th year on because one of his fatherland's most embittered critics projecting himself as an imagination as one living the life of a Greek god or prophet in Olympian ecstasy, never at home in the world of reality, yet at the same time harboring typically German romantic dreams of the kind that have contributed to the malignant growth of intellectual Nazism. Kafka, the Jew, was removed from the world of Judaism and critical of Christianity. As a German-speaking Czech, he was not quite a German, nor was he a Volkodoschka. Working as he did in the Social Security board that served primarily the laboring class, he did not belong to this social group, nor did he quite belong to the middle class. He was ordinary official, a functionary, yet writing was his real calling. His work as an insurance concerns reflects ironically upon his own 
perennial social and spiritual insecurity. All four had prepared themselves during their early manhood for a profession recognized by their own class as respectable and orderly, but all four failed to pursue their original profession in their mature years. Kierkegaard, trained for pastoral duties, refused to accept a pastorate and considered writing his ordained vocation, a vocation in which he excelled as a humorist, satirist, polemicist, and exegeter, exegetic scholar, exegetic scholar, as well as a philosopher. His rare achievement is all the more remarkable in view of his torrential production within a brief compass of time. Dostoevsky abandoned his military career for the uncertainties of journalism and freelance writing. Nietzsche was a classical scholar of the rarest promise, feeling completely at home in German antiquity. He turned to reforming mankind and produced a philosophy in which poetry, prophecy, and fantasy are fused into a hitherto unknown amalgamation and clothed in such a brilliant style that he ranks among the classic writers of the German language. Kafka, the jurist and official, tried himself out as a freelance writer but was forced to consider himself a failure to his dying day. They were lonely men and suffered intensely from the feeling of having remained unloved. They had, therefore, the urge to reveal themselves to their contemporaries or to posterity, and all four had the passion for confession of which Otto Weniger said, quote, great men speak and write only about themselves, close quote. Kierkegaard's entire work, especially his diary, lays bare his spiritual pains apart from the e explicit references to his unhappy love for Regine Olsen. Dostoevsky never executed his original plan to write the confessional novel, The Life of a Great Sinner but many of his characters undoubtedly reflect his own inner conflict. Nietzsche, quote, self-knower and self-executioner, close quote, presents in his letters rich autobiographical material, autobiographical, autobiographical material with strangely metaphysical analysis of his illness and before the outbreak of his insanity with detailed psychological self-portraits. Kafka's diary is full of reflections about himself as are his letters. All four were physically weak or sick. Three of them, Kierkegaard, Nietzsche, and Kafka, ended their literary production in their 40s. Kierkegaard died at 42, Kafka at 41. Nietzsche was a sick man during his entire adult life. Dostoevsky suffered most of his life from epileptic seizures. With the exception of Kafka, they showed great heroism in the face of physical adversity and their attitude in the perfect fulfillment of Pascal's quote, prayer to God for the right use of illness, close quote. Their, the thinking of all four occupied itself with suffering. Kierkegaard regarded it as the beginning of all spiritual insight. Dostoevsky saw in it the key to understanding others. Nietzsche felt it was the obstacle to be overcome. Only Kafka let it be a cruel and senseless, senseless fact. In their relationship to women, all four were unhappy. Kierkegaard and Kafka broke their engagements and like Nietzsche, never married. Nietzsche probably never had a genuine love experience. Dostoevsky's love life was a succession of unhappy adventures until he was past middle age and ended, entered a marriage of convenience. None of his novels depict a happy marriage. None of the four believed firmly in the success as a thinker or writer. Moments of arrogance or justified pride alternate with long-lasting depression. With the exception of Kafka, all considered passion, enthusiasm, and intoxicating the and the intoxicating sense of mission and inspiration their realm. In this, they were truly displaced persons in the original meaning of the word ecstasis. And Kierkegaard, as well as Nietzsche, employed the imagery of the dance to express this mood. After some initial success, both Kierkegaard and Nietzsche had to finance their own publications. The dying Kafka, little known as a writer, implored his friend Max Brod to burn all his unprinted works after having himself destroyed in all likelihood some manuscript at earlier times. Dostoevsky 
was successful after a severe struggle but hardly ever found the time to polish his works. As with Balzac, his perennial indebtedness to publishers forced him to hastily to hasty production, although his final years gave him a period of quiet and recognition. All four were city men who sensed that the cities would witness first the oncoming degradation of society, but none applied the amply available arguments of science or sociology to the prognosis of Europe's downfall. Each visualized it as the inevitable result of spiritual crisis, different as the diagnosis of this crisis was in the, mid, in the mind of each. There is a continuity of purpose and motivation in the work of these four that is more significant than literary influences can be. But Dostoevsky and Kierkegaard did not know each other. Nietzsche never read a single line of Kierkegaard's writings and did not carry out his intention of studying the psychological problem of Kierkegaard. But he did know some of Dostoevsky's cheap novels. Cheap novels. From the first reading, he sensed an instinctive and strange affinity for the Russian and felt quote-unquote intoxicated by Dostoevsky's both psychological penetration of man's innermost impulses. But Nietzsche could never go beyond admiring Dostoevsky as a unique psychologist and remained alien to the Christian note in his works. Both drew many of their prophetic energies from dreamlike moods, emotional states of exaltation, and visions of indefinable scope. In their universalism and breadth of vision, at least Nietzsche and Dostoevsky have something of a uonomo universala, universale of the Renaissance, which Dostoevsky expressed in his hope that his projected life of a great sinner would bring forth a concrete vision of quote-unquote world harmony, a goal alien to the austere demands of Kierkegaard and the moral exhaustion of Kafka.